What's up, everybody? It's Spencer Alessi, and this is the eSports Narrative. As an eSports event or tournament organizer, how do you grow your organization and expand your events? What is an amateur eSports pipeline? How do you develop your portfolio as an amateur eSports athlete? What does the amateur eSports industry look like in 10 to 20 years? Hello, hello, hello. Good morning, good evening, good night. Welcome to episode 44 of the Esports Narrative. I am your host, Spencer Alessi, and this is the podcast that's all about the exploration of competitive video gaming and the passionate communities that make it so exciting. Tonight's guest is John Fazio. He's the chairman and CEO of Nerd Street Gaming. Excuse me, Nerd Street Gamers. They are a Philadelphia-based gaming community of competitive and recreational video gamers. They produce a series of esports events, including Fragadelphia, Cheesadelphia, and many other gaming events. John, welcome to the show. Thanks for taking some time out tonight. No problem. It's a pleasure. So uh, I really want to just get into your earliest memories playing video games. What do you remember playing video games growing up as a kid? And like, what do you remember as, as things that stick out to you in, in terms of video games? My earliest memory playing video games had to be playing NHL on the Sega Genesis with my dad. Um, I think that was probably the earliest. And then he got me on Doom on a computer. Um, I think the first time I really got my competitive introduction was StarCraft. And I was like... The Christmas launch year, I remember seeing the trailers on, I forget what the magazines were back then, and I was real hyped for StarCraft to launch, and that was, you know, like, I remember the original Battle.net <laughs> grind, and uh, that those are probably my, my earliest memories. So, being a StarCraft fan growing up, you were probably exposed to esports uh, early on, I would say, because StarCraft was one of the first ones to come onto the scene, you know, as far as the competitive side goes. Why do you think esports is so exciting now and exploding now and having tremendous growth? Yeah, you know, so I, I talk a lot about that when we have various pitches to advertisers and sponsors that, you know, we've seen these waves before. You know, we saw StarCraft and the, the massive explosion in South Korea. We saw even Counter-Strike back in the, I uh, can't remember what version we were at, but the direct TV days, we saw so much money and attention get pumped into it and the waves have kind of come and gone. And this time is so different, I think, because of the mainstream exposure. You know, I think that's the obvious answer. Like we've, this time we've we've been able to tap into a culture of people who typically thought of what we used to call competitive gaming and now call esports is what's the word not real you know it was the what was it was it jimmy kimmel or Mm -hmm. i think it was jimmy kimmel who said you know the your what your fantasy of a fantasy um and and i remember that was like you know the the pop culture back then and now that's like a laughable pastime so i think you know the connection to the pop culture has enabled bigger and bigger organizations and brands to get in and justify their, you know, exposure to that pop culture channel and especially the younger demographics. And with that came a high level of capitalization. And now with things like the Overwatch League, this is a a level of capitalization and a decentralized spend that we've never seen before. Yeah, and you've definitely been able to take advantage of that with what you're creating. And I want to get to that in a minute. But first, I kind of like to get a little history You've been involved in tech for a while, it seems like, you know, in in doing some research. You started what's called Localhost in 2007. Can you just describe briefly what that is to everyone? uh, And what was it like building that? And and where did the focus of video games kind of come in as opposed to just the tech scene? Gotcha. So it's not Localhost. It was Jarvis. Um, Localhost is actually the esports arena name. Okay, cool. Uh, We created Localhost just, just this year. Um, I was a physics major at Drexel University. Uh, We went into the entrepreneurship program, my partner and I, to create what we call Digital Gaming Arena. Uh, We put together a business plan and tried to raise capital for an esports arena 12 years ago before esports as a word existed. Mm -hmm. And it failed miserably. We didn't get the capital that we wanted. 
And we said, we were really frustrated with that process of asking people for money for an idea. And at the time I, you know, I had an extensive background in coding and so did my partner, Chris Alfano. And we said, you know, let's, let's just do this ourselves. You know, let's just make our own money. And we both dropped out of school and started Jarvis, our software engineering firm. And over the next 10 years, built Jarvis into uh, a powerhouse consultancy that services, I I guess, almost over two dozen Fortune 500 businesses at this point, and was able to funnel its profits into an investment portfolio that included, you know, Nerd Street Gamers. It was only this year that I joined the Nerd Street Gamers team full time. So Nerd Street Gamers, like you said, um, you just joined them recently, but they've been around since it was t- 2014, right? Was when they, they actually launched. Yeah. So Nerd Street Gamers, uh, I actually created Nerd Street Gamers back in, it was, I guess, 2008, 2009, uh, because we had gotten this really cool office space for our software company, this big warehouse space. And it was really cool. And we just said, let's do a land party. You know, let's just have mm-hmm. some people here. And, you know, we had done land parties as kids where we showed up, you know, probably a dozen, two dozen of us at a friend's house in the basement with all of our computers. And we were just like, let's do that. You know, let's start there. And we did one of those. We did kind of some like console gatherings where we just invite people to bring their consoles and we push all the software engineers to the side and push all our desks out of the way and set up like game consoles in the middle. Um, and then we did some like some parties, you know, where we bring in a DJ and mix up the DJ with 20 consoles and various retro games going on. And we got a really, really cool response from the community and that people were like, this is an experience we can't get anywhere else. You know, we get to go out on a Friday night, hang out and just play video games and maybe have a drink and dance a little. And that was unique. And when we saw that demand, we kind of decided to focus on doing it more regularly. That attracted an old friend of ours, uh, Steve Shikosh, who ran uh, a Counter-Strike community, and he wanted to produce a BYOC Counter-Strike event in our office. And we said, sure, let's do it. Let's do it under the Nerd Street Gamers brand. And that became Fragadelphia. And over, I think it was the first maybe three events we ran as BYOCs and then we were able to provide the capital resources to start building computers and expanding the arena and the production facilities one by one each event we just kept saving and reinvesting the profits into building out what eventually became known as Fragadelphia and Cheesadelphia and go for broke our FGC community. Yeah you bring up a lot of things that I, I want to touch on but first when did you get the sense that you could make this work like long-term or full-time kind of thing. When did you have that? Yeah, we had, this was a part-time, you know, it was from 2009 until 2016. It was kind of just a passion project and it was something we did in our sides. And, you know, we ran the Fragadelphia and I don't think none of us uh, were working in our full-time. We were all, you know, had full-time jobs and we're doing this in moonlighting hours and I think it was the end of 2016, beginning of 2017, we started getting basically big brands that we had worked with in our consultancy started saying, what's up with esports? And, you know, when we're doing quarter million dollar consulting gigs and the clients saying that they want to spend money on esports, it kind of hit me that wow, something's changing here. You know, there's there's a there's a movement in the industry. And at the same time that I was seeing that kind of change in the economics uh, our community was just exponentially growing and people were so excited and happy and craving that you know amateur level esport event and you know the combo of seeing that really strong consumer demand and having our social media just constantly hit up with when's the next event when's when are you going to do my esport when are you going to do my city combined with seeing the economic tides turning uh, through our consultancy It was kind of just, uh, it felt right. And, you know, I had mentioned we did, we started 12 years ago with this in mind. So it kind of felt like coming full circle. I decided that I would step down as CEO of Jarvis uh, to take a backseat role to our president, my partner, Kevin Clow. And I'd focus full time on Nerd Street Gamers as CEO so that I could push forward what I saw as both, you know, a really cool business opportunity, but even more importantly, an opportunity that the consumers really, really need right now. Yeah. And I read in the Philly magazine that you received an investment from Ryan Howard and 76 Capital Esports. 
did that also give you some validation that this was actually something that was in high demand and that you could focus your time on did that that give you an, an another layer or another uh, piece of validation so to speak yeah absolutely you know i we had been going for about 6 months on this project full time we had just started producing a larger scale event which happened at the sun center studios last year uh, which was our first multi esport tournament going on at a kind of bigger scale. We had 2,400 people come. Previously, our biggest event was probably 300 people. So we were kind of in the grind there of growing, and they reached out, you know, with kind of saying, We've been looking to get into this. Um, you guys are kind of a leader and you're right in our backyard. What's going on? And I explained, you know, our ambitions to them and, you know, a capital investment is great you know that helps us expand quicker and move a little faster but frankly we didn't need the capital you know jarvis was you know content continuing to fund and expand the company but the vcs brought a very strategic partnership for us uh, in that ryan howard and the marketing and media exposure he brings with his celebrity status uh, alongside the other two partners john powell who who was of uh, cravco who was a big real estate company and george miller who's a who's a lawyer with a lot of uh experience in media buying we were really trying to position ourselves in a place where we had the right people behind us to to grow in the direction we need to go and this vc investment had all of those components for us it really it really validated us for sure yeah and that sounds like um you know a really smart way to think about it you know you probably hear a lot of stories of of companies that get these investments just purely for the money and there's really nothing behind it it sounds like this was all around just it, it just had a really naturally good fit which is exciting to hear because i like to hear stories about things that are cohesive fits and not things that are forced that are going to end up failing in the long run right and jarvis you know we had bootstrapped jarvis chris and i and then we brought on kevin as a partner we had never taken outside capital or investment so this is our first foray into venture capital and it was not taken lightly mm -hmm. you know we evaluated a lot of our options but at the end of the day uh we have you know what, what it really comes down to for me is i'm looking at an industry that's so strong and so exciting at the professional level everything from the overwatch league to what we're seeing with esl pro and e-league and even you know mountain dew league we're just seeing so much awesome growth all throughout the pro level and there's just this big void at the the amateur level the the, the developing esport athlete doesn't have enough resources to become a professional and if we want to compete with traditional sports or physical sports or, or whatever we're calling them these days then we're really going to have to provide that type of infrastructure that those sports do and we knew that to do that right and to do it at a national scale we were going to need at, you know an external funding partner as well as the, the the experience and skills that we don't have so what's your advice for other like local event series like you guys uh based in philly there's uh a number of other local event tournament organizers that i've talked to some on this podcast some just privately to see what they're doing but i'm curious what your advice would be for other local event series that want to kind of take the similar path to what you did like what's your advice for growing ex and expanding and finding partners or maybe even uh, some seed money or venture capital money? Like what's your advice for them uh, to grow and expand? I think that right now the, the, the local organizer scene is full of a lot of ambition, a lot of excitement and a lot of young talent, but there's a real, sh there's a, there's a serious lack of organization and, and accountability. So my advice to any local esport producer is to focus on putting in place organizations and more importantly standards so when you go to a sponsor and they ask you how do you plan to give me a return on my investment you're not just selling them you have something to back it up you have documents you've analyzed the data from your previous events you've predicted data for your future events it's work to line up the return on investment for the sponsors when you have an investor who comes in and says i'm going to give you this money and i want 20 times this money back in 10 years how are you going to do it for me you know have an answer have a plan so i think that the diligence in doing your research on how you're building your company is absolutely essential and i think right now too many esports organizers are just kind of one step at a time uh you know kind of 
horse blinders on the next event. You're not focused on necessarily growing a team you can trust for future events. You're not necessarily, you know, writing the standards to let somebody else do some of your work for you. Uh, that's the type of thing that I think we really need to start focusing on. Uh, and Nerd Street's going to try and help those producers do that by writing some of those standards, by producing some of the how-to manuals on how you can expect to produce a quality event. Yeah, it's really good advice. And I'm curious about the amateur esports thing. You just mentioned it a few minutes ago. Um, you have this great tagline on your website, America's Premier Esports, uh, Amateur Esports Pipeline. And I like the I like the language that you use. And I think it's, it, I don't know your answer yet, but I, th- I believe that, that that language is expressive of what you're going to say. It's like, what's your vision and what is the meaning behind this and what you're trying to create? Sure, you know, and, and it's a lot of these conversations we have in the esports industry now. Uh, some of these ideas will sound novel, and, and and I say to people like, I am copy pasting what I've learned from soccer. You know, I grew up in a in a path to pro uh, soccer environment where I got to go to you know elite training academies and training camps and play on teams that got sponsors that took us to showcases so colleges could see us you know I recognize that privilege and I'm trying to you know use that privilege and that experience that I had from that to provide the same sort of offering to you know to esports so when we talk about a pipeline it's a combination of two things it's a combination of one a place that you can go and meet people and train and two a place that you can showcase your talent so what we've done is we've created the nsg academy which is a series of weekly and monthly events that allow you to just show up at a venue in chicago philadelphia and dc for now and we're going to expand to more cities soon show up at a venue meet other people who want to be competitive gamers who want to be esports athletes pros the people who are interested in the industry whether they're streamers tournament admins tournament organizers or players there's a community for for them to go and there's a place for them to train and those academy events include boot camps showcases and summer camps and then what we've done on the flip side to make to give you know amateurs a place to show off their talent ultimately and expose themselves to future possibilities of being recruited is we created the nsg eastern conference championships those are three cities six esports 18 total events and that'll provide cash prize land tournaments for people who have gone to the academy or not to come out and compete and show off their skill and build a record and a portfolio for themselves as an athlete so that they can you know be looked at by esports organizations that are at the pro level and then for the organizations by connecting the sponsors that we've been able to get with these types of tournaments and producing this level of prize pot, which is that kind of sweet spot below, you know, professional, but above the homegrown lands, we're enabling esports organizations to take the risk of showing up. You know, we're empowering those organizations with a viability means. And that is another big component of what we're doing is we want to see those smaller esports organizations grow and continue empowering players like they've done. What do you think is a good way for amateur esports players to, like you said, develop that portfolio? Like you can go to the events, right? And you place or you, maybe you win these tournaments, but what's a good way to portray that and kind of market yourself or sell yourself? Do you just put it together like a traditional resume and put, you know, first place here, third place here, or is there another creative way that you're seeing people do it? I'm curious what you think about that, of how to like you market yourself as an esports player, like trying to get on a pro team, that kind of thing, going to these events. Well, that's what's so exciting to me, I think, because it differentiates esports from the, you know, the traditional sports and that, I have so many different opportunities as an esport athlete to market myself. Whereas as a soccer player, I got to be good on the field and that's all that's really, right. you know, I can put together some highlight reels, but those highlight reels are going to be of me can be good on the field. And that's really all that's going to matter. But as an esports athlete, I have the opportunity to maybe be a streamer and maybe my results won't speak for themselves, but my personality will garner attention for the sport in such a way that sponsors want to get involved. And maybe I'm the reason that some other really good players become a launch pad. 
Um, you know, there's also an opportunity for players to go into the organizer route, you know, players that have built really strong networks, have met all the players and organizations, but, you know, they're not seeing the financial viability to go pro. They've got a career, they're moonlighting, and they say, you know what, I want to empower more players by creating my own tournament, my own organization. There's just so much possibility right now as an esports player you know, prospective athlete, that that's really exciting to me. But as an athlete who wants to be a better competitor, you don't have much option right now. You know, you, you got to grind the ladders of whatever your sport is and you got to climb the online leaderboards and maybe you get accepted to a land where you've not had the experience of competing in person because you just grind it online in your computer uh, or, or console. Uh, so I think that this is what we're you know, going to be offering is that opportunity for people like that to show up and compete. And we really want to expand as fast as we can so that more people have access to those types of competitions. What do you think e the amateur esports scene looks like in 10 to 20 years from now? What do, you th what do you think it's looking like, how it's formulated? What do you think it looks like? I think that the most likely analogy will probably be soccer. I think the European academy structure that we know has done so well for you know international soccer as a product, I think is likely what to, to be what we'll see. And, and that's because the mo soccer has such a wide geographical spread and, and such a wide cultural spread that it had to kind of it had to learn how to combine a, a bunch of different systems you know the uefa league and and the and the um the spanish premier league function as their own independent organizations and might have different structures and the you know fifa has to come together and just kind of amalgamate that and figure it out uh, i think that's what we're going to see with esports i think we're going to see an amalgamation of tons of organ you know organizations academies league structures university structures high school structures and hopefully a unifying body to stand behind them and say here are the standards that we expect for competition and quality and here's all the different paths to pro. So 10 years from now, I think we're going to see hundreds of esports arenas all across the country. Thousands of land centers that had previously really struggled to drive business will we'll start to increase as the popularity of esports continues to spread. And I think we'll have an assortment of companies just like Nerd Street Gamers growing those amateur and semi-pro and professional opportunities because it's going to be increasingly lucrative for sponsors and brands to get into. Now, we've talked about amateur, we've talked a little bit pro about professional esports. We haven't touched on the the collegiate uh, collegiate side of things, and I'm curious where you stand on where that fits into uh like you said the amalgamation. Where does collegiate esports fit into this mix as far as amateur versus esports? Where do you see that fitting in? So in the same way that we're kind of looking up to the professionals to dictate what we should expect as competitors in the amateur side, we're doing that at the collegiate level too. So, you know, whether it's TESPA or Star League, um, or, or, and, I, and I know there's a few other organizations at the collegiate level, and now we have the NCAA getting into this and hiring an organization to do, you know, a, a look into it. Uh, we're looking forward to seeing what they have to say. The issue for us is that we don't want to put any player or student in a situation where we've limited their ability to compete. So we will play nice with the NCAA. We will play nice with any of the collegiate organizations out there. Um, right now, we've gotten interest from a number of colleges. Uh, what we've tried to say is let, let us help you develop programs. Let us help you develop your academies uh, and, and let us push you into those existing collegiate structures so that we're not sitting here reinventing the wheel. Yeah, definitely. Because as this begins to develop, like you said, there'll be more structure. There'll be more presumably kind of rules or guidelines for the collegiate esports scene. And um, without knowing what those are, it's almost like you're saying, like you're saying, you don't want, really want to cut off the hand that feeds you kind of thing if it gets to a point where that becomes a way to feed or develop talent in esports, right? Yeah. And, and, you know, when you had asked about the 10 year vision 10 years from now, I want every single pro who's in ESL pro or Overwatch League or Star League or TESPA at a college level. Having said, I grew up going to NSG events. You know, that's that's really our goal. We 
want to we want to make that platform a, a place for you to launch your you know your career whether it's collegiate or whether it's professional so we we see ourselves as kind of sitting one the one step below them i love that that's that's kind of a cool uh mission statement that it, it's more about like the legacy and the impact that you leave than than anything else you know yeah, and, and like I said before, that's what's so exciting to me about esports is that you have those opportunities. Um, you know, so I had, I actually, believe it or not, wrote Shroud an email, uh, which I was like, there's no way he'll get it. And he hasn't responded yet. But I said, he, I caught him on a Twitch stream talking about like the future, you know, and I think it was right after he had gotten cut and he was focusing full time on streaming. And he was talking about, well, you know, what, what do I do in the future? What am I beyond the player? And I wrote him an email saying, you have an opportunity because you're not just uh you know your name your shroud you're a brand you have an opportunity to use that and build something with it and i said to him you know you can turn around and be a launch pad and an accelerator for players because you've done it you know the world you have the experience you have the network you have the capability just like in traditional sports where you know the, the pro bowler comes back in and mentors uh you know the rookie you have the opportunity to do that to pick your your mentees and to, to kind of cultivate talent on your own and i think those opportunities are unique to esports a little bit because of the way that we have aliases and we have this kind of disconnected brand that's a little different than the player and i can use that to grow beyond me as the competitor so i'm excited to see where some of these player brands start to go yeah and in 2017 and 2018 and beyond is definitely the year of the brand right everything is so heavily uh media and social media produced production uh, kind of mentality or environment that everyone has a brand. It, it might not be a big brand or it might not be uh, the most noticeable brand or recognizable celebrity status, but everyone has a brand. And I think that uh, to, to add to your point, a lot of streamers or, or gaming personalities don't fully understand how much leverage they could have if they started thinking about their brand uh as a brand, like at their personality and their streaming as a, as a yep. personality. So I'm curious what you think is maybe one or two things that you see streamers or gamers not doing that they could be doing that are like maybe easy things or things you think they should be doing to help develop their brand to, you know, market them or whatever they're trying to do. I think that right now, most of the really good streamers are partnered with organizations. And I think if I was going to say there's one thing they're not doing a good enough job of, it's being independent. You know, when you rely on a, the organization to do the marketing and social media for you, uh, you don't control your own brand. And at the end of the day, you're going to be reliant on their infrastructure. So I think that streamers could help themselves a little bit more by building their own infrastructure. You know, it starts really small with things like websites and Twitter pages, uh, but it gets a lot bigger than that when it gets to things things like proposals to sponsors and, you know, knowing that you can do that on your own and having your own uh, proposal uh, template and having a contract to sign your own deals uh, where, you know, and I recognize that many of the streamers are prohibited from doing that because of their streaming contracts, but knowing how to do that and being able to build that infrastructure and focusing on that, I think is how you, you build yourself as a brand um, on the streaming side. I think I, I, I'd really like to see a little bit more of an engagement of that traditional world sport or, or traditional sports world, um, or you know, uh, on on the flip side, uh, an engagement of the the what I would call non accessible the people who aren't able to uh, compete in physical sports who have opportunities because of esports i'd love to see a bigger showcase of that you know esports is a really really unique opportunity at accessibility where we can offer comp you know the competitive benefits of growing up as a competitor becoming the leader learning collaboration and teamwork uh, we can offer that to a, a wider range of people who might not be able to compete in physical sports yeah, I really like that. And I like what you said about the traditional world and, and tying that in. What's been the most difficult thing for you along your journey uh, that you've had to deal with or maybe a, a setback or a roadblock that you've had to deal with um, getting to this point? And then what do you see as maybe a roadblock or a hurdle in the future? 
Uh, I, I think what I've had the most frustrations with are likely to be the biggest hurdles for the industry as a whole moving forward, which is simply accountability and organization. Um, people, right now, you have this flood of attention uh, and big money and big companies and big brands who want to get into esports. And without that accountability and organization at the smaller level, there's a lot of capital flowing into what I'll call irresponsible parties. Um, so we've had setbacks with parties where we were promised, you know, the moon uh, and we planned for the moon and it was pulled right out from underneath us and we learned hard lessons and had to adjust quickly. Uh, but also on the flip side of having you know our, our kind of sponsors pulled on the, on the other side we've relied on third party organizers and partners who have completely fallen through you know we've put serious money and infrastructure behind people who produce esports only to not even show up and that has been uh, epidemic in the in the esports world is people who uh, don't build don't take the time to be diligent to have an organizational structure and be accountable you know with their commitments i think that as money continues to flow into esports and as esports sort of continues to grow into the mainstream that's going to be a big issue and the people who can't you know keep up uh, and grow up really uh, are going to get left behind and, and are going to be bitter. And I think the people who, who do are going to be the reason that we have a future that looks, you know, quite possibly larger than the sum of all traditional sports. So do you think esports as a whole is going to look a lot different now than it will in say 20 or 30 years? You think it'll look kind of the same? What do you think, if you had to project the future a little bit, what do you think it looks like compared to today? Yeah, think about even football or basketball 20 years ago uh, or, or the NHL 30 years ago. Um, how much has changed to you know what we would consider pillar sports that have been around for you know generations and they rapidly evolve. Now, you know, imagine we're just in the beginning. Our pace of evolution is so much faster that it's, you know, it's hard to predict. I mean, quite frankly, the perfect example is PUBG. And, you know, that's kind of cliche now almost, but, but what happened with PUBG where there's nobody in the world who predicted that kind of success overnight, you know, imagine if overnight we had a new NFL, you know, like those things haven't really happened yet. So, I think that we're going to have an, an, a face of the industry that looks so different, we won't even recognize it. Now, lastly, I just want to ask about kind of the local tournament structure as far as some of the, the larger titles go, like Overwatch, League of Legends, or Counter-Strike, some of the bigger titles. Have you experienced a tightening of the of the developer um, as far as what you can have at your event or have you experienced any of that? I've heard rumors of them kind of limiting the crowd, so to speak, of, of who can run these events and how they can run them kind of thing. Have you experienced that and you see that as a hurdle to get over or at all or anything in the future? Uh, we've definitely experienced it and understandably so. You know, I think a lot of my counterparts and organizers are very frustrated with some of the restrictions, uh, but I understand them. You know, I want to see levels of capitalization like we're seeing with the Overwatch you know, League with 12 teams coming in at $20 million franchise fees and a total of $240 million distributed across 12 organizations all across the country. That's that's real capitalization. If you want organizations to do that, you better expect that they're going to control their intellectual property down to the nail. You know, so I respect what they're doing. I respect why they're doing it. It can be very frustrating, but at the end of the day, they are setting the tone, and we're going to play nice. We're going to work with them. Um, so, you know, on the on the Blizzard side. We've had a great history with Blizzard. Uh, their community outreach teams in each individual sport are all awesome. Um, we've played nice. We've gone through and gotten our license for Cheesadelphia, which is, uh, you, you know, has its license, has its tournament license, Hearthstone event, Brotherly Brawl, which we just announced that has its license. And then for the Overwatch, uh, we're working closely with the Philadelphia Fusion to try and see what we can do underneath their license because there's no opportunity at all for us to play in the Overwatch space because, you know, the league is controlling it. And f I respect that. I, I think in the future, as we prove our accountability, we'll prove a viable usage for Blizzard. And that's kind of the point of what we're doing. We want to we prove that. We want to make 
a framework for competition that's so accountable and so distributed that Blizzard goes, oh yeah, we want we want we want to have our Overwatch tournaments in that NSG conference. That makes sense. Um, and then you know something like Blue Hole. Uh, running PUBG, I can't even imagine the nightmare <laughs> on their end. <laughs> you know, like I, I do not. And I, as a, somebody who comes from a software development world, I do not envy scaling this at the pace that they did and were forced to. Um, so, you know, we reach out to them. I, I am actually reaching out to Bluehole basically on a biweekly basis saying, hey, guys, don't forget about us. We mm-hmm. want in. Um, just asking, begging, pleading to let us throw a tournament saying, you know, if you let us throw one of those smaller 15, 20 K tournaments for PUBG, that's how you build an ecosystem of developed players. Cause you know, the, the, the big 250 K prize pots are great, but those are invite only they're, they're hard to get to. Um, we need to build that lower ecosystem and, you know, they say no, and it's frustrating, but I get it. You know, if I'm blue hole and I just scaled and blew up like this so quickly, I don't want some tournament getting you know hacked and ruining my Mm -hmm. reputation overnight because you know that's possible so if we want to see esports get that level of capitalization if we want to see the growth that we're all excited about then we're going to have to accept that tightening of regulation and control and really help them control their content better we we, you know we as esports organizers now have an obligation to the publishers to best distribute their content uh because that's really, you know, our objective to get more people playing games. And like you said, with uh, Philadelphia Fusion, it's it's almost about getting creative. And what I heard you say hinted at that is like just getting creative and finding ways to integrate either current local teams that are playing in these leagues or find another unique way to partner and and get these tournaments at, so you can run them or run them jointly or collaborate with them to kind of show the value and show that you can, you know, help their brand not, uh, not hurt it. Yep, exactly. Awesome. So lastly, where can people connect with you with Nerd Street Gamers with what you're doing? And if you want any, if you have any shout outs or plugs that you'd like to make, uh, the floor is yours and let people know where they can kind of communicate and engage with the community that you're building. Cool. So you can find Nerd Street Gamers on Twitter. Uh, We're on Facebook, nerdstreetgamers.com. Any variation of spelling will get you there. Um, I'd like to give a shout out to our sponsor, Cougar. Uh, They are a peripheral company that provides our chairs, our keyboards, our mice, our headset. And now they've got these really awesome micro ITX cases that we're using to build the boxes for our Chicago arena. Uh, Cougar took a chance with us, jumped in early, uh, has been an amazing partner and sponsor for us. So I'd love to just show our appreciation publicly for them. Um, and other than that, I'd say find an event near you and come out soon. Awesome. John, it was, it was a pleasure having you on. Um, we talked a lot about, uh, we talked about a lot of interesting subjects and in ones that have kind of piqued further interest in my mind to talk about. And, uh, I appreciate you taking some time out tonight and wish you and nurse street gamers all the best of luck with what you're doing and creating. Uh, I know I'll be watching closely to see what you're doing and hopefully make it out to an event. Um, And I appreciate your time tonight. Thanks for having me. It's been a pleasure. And with that, I just want to remind everyone that if this all goes as planned, this show is just the beginning. Thank you, listeners. I really appreciate you. It would mean the world to me if you subscribed and shared the show. Your word of mouth is amazing.